Bye. Um, oh, wow, nice. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining in and spending your time for a Sunday guftugu, as we say. Uh, I'm Anshika Varma. I'm a photographer, but I'm also the founder for Offset Projects. And at Offset, basically what we try to do is look at um, looking at photo books, looking at visual books, artist books, um, and what are the dynamics in which artists create books, but also what we can do in getting those conversations outside of artist and photography circles. And uh, Guftugu is a series of conversations for those of you who um, might not be familiar with the term. It's a Urdu Persian term that actually literally means casual, candid conversations. And that's how we are going to go today as well. Um, we have Avni Tanya with us right here. Avni, do you want to wave out to everyone? Hi, Hi guys. <laughs> so uh, we're going to start in a little bit, but the idea over here is actually that we're going to talk about Avni's practice, but also her curiosity and maybe slight obsession with the museum altogether, <laughs> you know. And um, so we're going to start maybe in another couple of minutes. Yes, Avni has got the, the museum spectacles on. Is this when you're the museum researcher? Great. So just to give you guys a little bit of a backdrop, um, Avni is a mix of um, curiosity keeper, I think, and, uh, and researcher, designer, and photographer. And um, so she dabbles with all three mediums, sometimes collectively and, uh, and sometimes separately as well. And one of the primary books that we're going to discuss with Avni today is actually this particular book. I don't know if you guys can see it clearly. It's called A Selective Guide to the VNA's uh, South Asian Collection. And um, this was a book made by Avni, which is, um, I think you can also get it on the VNA bookshop, right Avni? Yeah, also on the Delphina page. It's yes. a really cheap book. Which is amazing five, because five that's, pound. Usually, <laughs> that's usually the tough bit, you know. <laughs> And so the book um, was the culmination of a residency program actually at Delphina Foundation, right? Yeah. And this was in 2017 to 2018. And, um, and I think uh, maybe we can just start then. Do you want to, should we, should we begin? Are yeah, you sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Anshika. Thank you for having me and no. I've been listening to all the amazing talks you've been doing which is a real honor to be <laughs> able to oh, share wow. practice also i mean avni and i actually uh, did share some book conversations early not earlier this year okay sorry late last year i'm losing yeah. track of time being indoors from so long uh, where i had the super fun chance to set up one of the offset library pop-ups in her studio which is in goa and uh, and so we had her book and uh, well we were meant to have a conversation uh at this point of time sorry one second uh, renu i think some people asked me there's a meeting id there is no meeting id actually it's just a link on the offset page but what i can do is uh for people who might want to join in uh Oh, one second. Let me just get this in order. But I can also send you guys a link which I'll put on this chat itself. And if you can share. Oh, thank you, Ankit. It seems that meeting IDs and non-IDs have been figured out without my knowledge. I'm so sorry. I am terrible at technology and we're trying to kind of make sense of it. But thank you for helping out in that, Ankit. Uh, what I will do is I'll just put in another link here that you guys can use. Uh, sorry, one sec. This is the link to join in. I think for people who don't have a Zoom app or a Zoom subscription or anything of that sort, they might ask you for your email ID. Uh, but 
apart from that you sh- that's what i had to do when i was listening to the other conversation you had to put in an email id right yeah. i mean it's just a validation thing that uh, that they do because at one point of time uh, there were a lot of hackers getting into uh, zoom conversations and webinars with explicit content so so they were like give us your email id and then you can get it uh, but i i hope uh, people are able to join i'm also just checking my settings once to make sure that there is no such thing but yes there is there is a webinar id which i think ankit has put out which is absolutely correct thanks thanks ankit <laughs> So um coming back to the selective guide to the VNA's um, South Asian collection um I mean just if you can tell us a little bit about how you ended up at the Victoria and Albert Museum altogether you know <laughs> <laughs> um that's a bit of a longer story but uh, there was a Delphina Foundation which is a residency program in London had in, had a call to for artists to come and re- stay at the Delphina but reinterpret the South Asia collection at the VNA so VNA is one of the largest museums in the world which is in London it's a treasure trove of artifacts which are more to do with the design perspective so objects that were designed by human beings that were of value of production value um in a But sense how is this going to be like uh, value according to who <laughs> you know yeah so i mean they have of course they have everything from michelangelo's diaries to kanta saris to you name it you know and i mean all of london is a treasure trove in that sense of stuff that was brought from colonies to right. the uk in a sense to um enrich the industrial right. industrial revolution era of producing making craft enriching new techniques like the kew gardens is is a museum of plants so they literally went around the world and picked plant plants as specimens and brought them back That's so in that sense like the, my kind of museum <laughs> you know i'd be happy lost over there yeah it's it's a brilliant brilliant uh, archive of stuff uh so the call was to propose to do something at the vna uh with their south asia archives because it had been i think that year was the 70th year of indian independence uh um, they call it the uk india year of relationship building right <laughs> Didn't you also do uh, the? Yeah, we curated a, a, a photography exhibition uh, in Cardiff, actually, and so that that was one of the questions that I had for our um, collaborator in Cardiff. I was like, "What do you mean by year of relationship building?" <laughs> you know, but okay. um, yeah, I tried to change that relationship building. <laughs> yes, it's a very distraught relationship in many ways. But so, how did you then choose? I mean, what, uh, like you're saying, it's a massive archive, and also, I mean, these are archives with very specific agendas as well, right? Like, I mean, these collections, like you're saying, they're not necessarily um, objects that were procured for for their beauty or cultural relevance, or because someone was completely emotionally moved by an art work. You know, yeah. it's all about <laughs> how do we scale production on something like this and make it larger uh, for access mostly in europe as well right um yeah so the vna is really a massive massive collection of objects that have textiles that have um just you name it and they have a specimen of it of really the production of the various processes involved in production okay. and my task was really simple in the sense that they gave me a free reign they said go into the museum and do what you will which as an artist okay. is an amazing amazing brief right it um it kind of lets you just get lost and the museum is built in such a way that there's several parts of okay. this institution uh there are hang on let me try and share yeah, just There's a map, like a floor map of sorts, that's there in the book as well. Is that something that I can? 
yeah but let me try and, let me try and show you um some photographs of the actual museum sure that would be amazing um i mean i don't have too many but i can just start just to get a sense of thing. yeah yeah uh, hang on i'm still very new to this <laughs> no worries take your time slide show it and then i'm going to share my screen okay um so this is this is this is not this is not the building the building is really grand and this is one of the 500 different galleries in the museum but it's really big and expansive and it has this quality of being very intimidating because it there are these prized possessions that are in the museum um and i mean i don't i don't mean to interrupt but you also worked from objects that were accessible to the public and some that were not that weren't. right yeah okay. so i i kind of i kind of tried to spend as much oh no i this is hung i can't actually that's okay don't worry about it no <laughs> uh oh eh um, okay now my hmm um yeah i chose objects that were okay before i before i started to choose objects let me backtrack and say that uh while i was spending time in this museum it meant that i was not only looking at their collection that you can see in the gallery but also their archives where they keep all the objects that are not displayed so for the longest time i was really obsessed with what is not displayed and why is it not displayed um i don't know why this can't this won't screen share oh maybe if you um is this on preview yeah maybe if you shut the preview and start again do you think that might help maybe let me try but also like i mean one of the things that i I've, i've been questioning personally and i i think we we had a small very quick chat about this was what are i mean when we talk about an archive we often just we often forget about the politics and the dynamics and the building up of that archive right um yes now we now perfect um and so i'm sure i mean you would have had some thoughts about like what you were looking at i mean you've also spoken about those thoughts and ideas in the book as well uh but if you could just share the act of going through these archives and you know the kind of questions that it brought about for you that would be really nice too um so a lot of a lot of what i was uh looking at was not what was on display but what was in the archives things that were not not displayed and what are the right. political things that are not displayed uh the vna also has a documentation of all their objects from the 17 1800s how they were brought so there are detailed detailed uh, sort of handwritten notes of um curators who let me try and show you a video actually um uh uh detailed handwritten notes of curators who have really articulated why this object was brought where was it brought from uh, what is its relevance can you see it yeah um so this is this is just one of the many 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 documents that is like a boring handwritten uh, have typed out manuscript which is just detailing the archive what is in there why was it brought in what is its politics um and so i was really in this space where there was so much content to sift through to try and see what were the original impulses why did they bring these objects in um where are the gaps sometimes it says this object was gifted by so and so to this person but why was this object gifted or the the prince who died in this battle with the british his wife gifted it to the british officer so why was she gifting something when they were responsible for killing her husband so those right. gaps were there and i started to think of all these different stories and different versions and of course only when you have time and energy to look at all this so in, i mean in london the great thing is that 
all of this is accessible to everyone. It's not uh, that I had any special privilege because I was an artist in residence, but anybody who wants to can access this. You can access all their archive in terms of the documentation. You can go and say that there is that object on your website and I want to go and look at it and they will take you five floors down and bring it out and show it to you. Wow, that sounds like a fun month that you would have spent. I mean, I don't yeah, know. Actually, fun four year. months. Yeah. Fun four months. And then because I had spent so much time and a lot of my learning also came from chatting with people, people who were my friends, my peers at the Delfina Foundation, peers that I met over Instagram who were curious about what I was doing. And then we would sort of have a chat or they would come and meet me at the museum. And I started to have a, a record of almost like a diary of all these conversations I was having with very interesting people, sometimes with my friends back home. Um, and, and I figured that this is what is sort of missing in this grand narrative of the museum, that there isn't someone who is talking with you through the thing. Of course, there are guidebooks, but yeah. those guidebooks are never actually telling you these sort of anecdotes and yeah. stories. They're kind of very detached, pragmatic, three yeah. sentences. This is the history of it and, you know, kind of leave it there. Uh, so I thought it would be a fun uh, thing to try and create a guidebook, you know, what would it, I mean, I'm really interested in books as a form. Um, and I thought, okay, let's, let's try and explore this idea of um, telling stories from multiple perspectives and telling right. stories of various objects. So um, I began to write to friends and say that, okay, if I were to send you this object, mm -hmm. uh, a photograph of this object, and the VNA's website is brilliant. All objects are on it. So you just put down a keyword and it'll bring up objects. Okay. Um, so I had, I had lots and lots of uh, collections of objects that I had made myself, like a shawl from Kashmir, which is like a five meter hand embroidered, a uh, map of Srinagar oh. um, made in the 18th century or uh, so on and so forth. And so I started to send these objects to friends as emails or as phone conversations and say that, okay, does, what does this, what does this make you think of? Or, yeah. And then, so that's, that's how this book sort of came about as a collection where I wanted it to not be one voice, but be a multiple voices right. and, and kind of breaking up the notion that there is only one right way in looking at an object, but there are multiple perspectives and multiple things are triggered and how people read these things evolves all the time. Right. Um, so I mean, actually, that was one of the things that I was, sorry, did I interrupt you? No, no, no. <laughs> okay. No, one of that, I mean, that was the most exciting thing for me when I, you know, of course, spoken to you about the project, I think, right after you came back. And then, of course, when I saw the book and, and this idea of, of reimagining the museum, you know, of kind of recontextualizing it, because, of course, to a certain degree, well, not just the VNA Museum, but the idea and the act of institutionalizing objects, you know, itself, um, kind of put one idea of the historical context of that history into place and erase another. And over here, of course, because, you know, it is the VNA and, you know, it was like we were a British colony. There's so many more dynamics of, you know, politics that comes into place. And maybe one of the things since we are looking at this book is I really liked um, the, the Ajmer, the pillars that you have. Yeah. And, and so, uh, so I know, you, so you found this object in a way, you found the image of it, but of course you visited the place as well. And, and then how you brought in these, um, these reimagined ideas of what it was and the other history of what it also could be, but was not put into the museum is something that was really interesting. And I think you do that towards the end, the second half of the book, right? Where, uh, Mm, let me just kind of, sorry, give me a second and I'm going to 
like where you got artists to kind of come and respond to that object as well and maybe we can actually go to the painting which i know is kind of a portrait of a lady uh yes huh? yeah yeah and maybe you can just uh, you know just for our viewers also to kind of get a sense of how you started with one object which is this painting and then the multiple responses that it had you know that might be quite interesting yeah know. just to quickly talk about the structure and the design yeah. of this book it kind of tries to follow a guide book but breaks that notion up so each so the book is divided into these chapters and each chapter starts with this red colored photograph because the because the original pictures the original objects are so exquisite that i wanted to take away from that from the beauty of that which you can of course look up online and you can um, oh wait you're looking at the ajmer columns no no no, no this is just oh. an image this is just for people to kind of get a sense of what you're saying and what it looks like in the book do you do you see my screen yes, yeah i do i see the indian lady painting yeah so um so the so the idea was that this comes as like a single colored thing with a description of the object from the original caption and then i i sent these to some friends himali who at that time wasn't i didn't know her but i'd seen her performances and read some of her poetry and i thought she she had a really interesting way of looking yeah. at the world in a sense so yeah. i said her i sent her a bunch of objects and said that uh, you know would you be interested in responding and she picked this and she writes this beautiful poem which just kind of describes the painting um and has has a humorous take on it i can actually share this pdf later if people want to read but um i thought that i thought that that was a really beautiful way to sort of write a a visual description but in words right. and then the same object um, a friend of mine yeah, abhi later i think in the book also abhi sethi who yes. also <laughs> i was like wait a minute abhi what uh, abhi and i went to school together and college together and she's a performance artist and uh she had this wasn't a part of the of this book really in the beginning but i had shown her this photograph and a few days later she sent me this picture on whatsapp right uh, where she had recreated um you know a contemporary <laughs> version of this on her terrace smoking yeah. in the same yellow kurta that the original is wearing i mean uh, i absolutely love this i have to say when i saw it and i just thought it was so perfect you know in that sense of and i like how um, um you know in the physical description of this spread um it follows that same language like that very dispassionate language in a certain way very like this is what exists right in front of you and yet you kind of you know if you go back and and forth on those spreads um it completely changes the context and yet it kind of has this echo of of the contemporariness of maybe the work and its understanding and its rereading as well yeah and i mean this image in itself is quite fascinating of of an indian lady smoking a hookah but she's sitting on a chair so yeah. the european design has entered the indian subconscious it's entered miniature paintings but it's still a really comical thing because she's sitting with her legs up Oh, with one leg up, which is how I sit on a chair. Which is how I would sit on a chair too. Yeah. Um, sorry. And so, can you talk a little bit about how you actually then? Because I'm sure there's a lot of research that went into this, and by the end of it, there must have been thousands of objects that you must have kind of read through. And so, then, what made you kind of put these together? Like, yeah, actually, the Primark trousers is also what I was going to get to next. So maybe. in because this suddenly comes into contemporary history as well you know one of the observations you've mentioned in the book is um i don't know if it's you who's one of the writers but i feel like it was you who said that it was also interesting to note that the acquisitions that were available um kind of stopped at a particular point of time and post colonial acquisitions um maybe something like these primark trousers actually didn't go into the south asia 
Yeah. Section. So that's that's quite interesting, right? How things get categorized inside a museum like that. So they have various galleries. They have uh, China. They have uh, Middle East. They have India. I mean, South Asia, which was I think was called the India Gallery, and then they renamed to South Asia to be politically correct. But <laughs> uh, but how these objects enter the museum is really complicated, and then how they actually sit in these different categories because then there's also performance as a category and there's also um, rapid response as a category and rapid response is this contemporary wing that they started within their design discipline where they said that we need to be able to be relevant on a contemporary way where we bring in objects of the everyday and this is where i was most interested because that that is really what i'm interested in my life in a sense of of how objects represent our contemporary times in life yeah. and um, so this was so they have this collection called the rapid response collection and in that they had this jeans from primark uh, trousers pair of trousers from primark which uh, was made in the in the same factory on a, a, which was a part of the Rana Plaza in outside Dhaka, which collapsed in 2013, I think it yeah, was. Yeah, it was a, actually a really big news that suddenly brought about. Yeah, and it consciousness it, into fast fashion. H and M now has a conscious brand. <laughs> yes. Because of these things, these were global events. So they collected this pair of trousers from that factory as a reminder of this tragedy that then kind of has changed global fashion, fast fashion. Right. Um, but to me, what was interesting was that this doesn't come in the South Asia collection. It sits in another part of the museum. But to me, it's representative of UK's relationship with South Asia in a very relevant way. In um, maybe uh, too, too honest a way for them to be okay with <laughs> you know and so i tried to make this book i mean though it's called a selective guide uh, but it's really a personal sort of telling of how i felt so i write also in a really personal way in a almost right. anecdotal way right um, and sorry yeah and then there's this object which is from the children's museum which is also from vna but is not in the in the South Asia gallery, but it's in the children. So I tried to collect these various things and sort of see. So I have, a, I have a museum question, maybe, since you are my museum person right now. <laughs> I mean, one of the things I want to know, because I mean, of course, when, when museums create their archives, they are, they are keywords and categories and subcategories and some subcategories, of course, that these come in. But I mean, a lot of how these categories and keywords are then put into place is also through the context that, you know, and the perspectives with which the work has been taken, let's just say, right? And so when you have something like, like the Primark trousers from Rana Plaza or the kids rickshaw, um, for whatever contemporary reasons, they want to put it in the category of, uh, sorry, rapid collection or oh, sorry, rapid, rapid response. response or children's museum. Are there no parallels that then also connect it with South Asia or is it like a history that gets completely erased to a certain degree? Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, there is no way to know this. There is no way to know that there is a... That no, is in the sense that there, the there are South Asia objects in other parts of the museum you'll only know if you can recognize them it's right. it's almost as if this idea of the south asia gallery is a fixed idea of this pre pre-independence era history of the museum even though they have like sabhyasachi's lehenga in their collection or a mango <laughs> dress in their collection but they don't display that those things are not displayed even though they belong in the south asia right. collection Okay. Um, so, so it's 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 really fascinating and mind-boggling. But it also, I mean, to answer your question, it it really is in how this museum is structured in this very very complicated hierarchy and mesh of things that right. you know, things don't connect and don't um, speak to each other. <laughs> yeah. 
and i mean they were they were nice enough to always say that that is precisely why the museum brings in artists or young people because they want people to be able to pick Ask these questions then maybe and so so for you what would be what is your version of the museum because i know this is i mean of course we have the vna archive that you have worked with but this is not your only act of museum reading right like um to start with i mean to go a few years back in time maybe um you made a a book um to do with bangalore and i think this is when you were were you still studying at srishti at that time was yeah it was my final uh, project okay it was at srishti and it which I is mean, kind of like a traveling museum that's how i look at that book in some yeah, way you want me to pull it yeah, up yeah that would be nice if you can just share an image about that okay. um let me just find it uh should i actually just play a video of the whole book will that sure be? that yeah that sounds good um let's try this <laughs> sorry i'm acting like a complete don't worry zoom no but perfect yes um so the book was called the snap rope and other stories from the new bangalore but it oh my dog is snoring on the side <laughs> <laughs> that's so cold it's really hot in goa right now so i get it <laughs> um the book really started because uh, as a as a process of meaning making for me uh, i moved to bangalore as a 18 year old starry eyed and bangalore was it was 2008 and bangalore was going through its rapid transformation in that decade or in the last two decades it sort right. of really transformed and gone through this uh, influx of people new industries have started the city is now bursting at its seams right um, and i was always taken to museums as a child either through school or through my parents who loved history but i never found a connection in the museum to my everyday life okay. and similarly when i went to bangalore and i was trying to make meaning of this big city that i had moved to from ahmedabad which is much smaller smaller pace and i moved to this new city where everything was just so intense and so much class disparity i mean you're un- you you're really sort of you can articulate all of that because i was 18 then and I'm trying to sort of grapple with uh what it means to be an outsider in a new city what it means to be linguistically different from others and so so it is a very fast video and we are just playing again <laughs> yeah we can just let that run in loop behind while you talk so it's fine so and at that point i was also i mean i still am photography is one of the main mediums that i work with and i was trying to see how picture taking uh could be used as a tool for myself as a lens to see the world mm-hmm. um but not in a documentary fashion because that's not that's not what came to me um kind of organically but right. what came to me organically was to collect objects um so whenever i was out about in the city i would be collecting um say a newspaper clipping or that that talked about a, a a funny incident like a tree that was chopped off outside the chinnaswamy cricket stadium in bangalore a 70 year old tree was chopped down because people were tripping on its roots to buy tickets oh i had no idea about the match that. to the ipl match but they were tripping on the root they were tripping on the root so the government has decided so they said, we must cut this tree so quickly you know so on these sorts of funny pretexts um things were changing in the city and uh, i kind of wanted to make sense of it and i said okay i'm going to go and see the tree since it's in the newspaper i'll drive by and see it right. and it, sure enough there it was this tree that was um hacked and as a photographer as an artist how do you make meaning of it of course you can take a picture of it but yeah. uh, which i did also but i also brought back a root uh, a part of the the branch or like a part of the trunk branch. or something <laughs> <laughs> uh i brought that home and photographed it and then in a similar fashion i started to collect various objects and when it came to making a final diploma project i said that okay i'm going to see 
how these can come together in the form of a museum, which is my museum, which is a personal take on the idea of the city of Bangalore. Um, and so it became a traveling museum because the book. <laughs> yeah, because it's easy. This is how this is how things are. Photographs are kind of these moments in time that you can carry with you over time and they don't have to be. I mean, going to a museum is kind of like looking at a photograph because the object is behind glass. It's it's functionless. It's form. I mean, it has its form, but you can't touch it. You can't interact with it. It's lost its history. You only know about it through this caption, which is also kind of how a photograph is. You know, it's right. lost. It's lost that moment in time. But I mean, you, in some ways, it freezes time. But then you still cannot access that the exactness of that time with the photograph, right? Like it's still your own reading and baggage that goes into it. And so I think for me that that connection between photography and museological narratives or museumization of objects has this parallel that it doesn't matter if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. And actually, I think maybe I don't know if if it happened in the same order of events, but I I know that uh, Tipu's Tiger, which was an exhibit at the v Museum, which is part of your selective reading yeah. of the museum there, was something that you also found in, thank you, what you also found in Bangalore, but like, uh, am I right? Yeah, I mean, this is the funny bit because I didn't know about the V&A when I was 22. I had no idea <laughs> the V&A existed. I'd never been to London. Uh, but I went to the... Tipu Pal Tipu's Palace, Tipu's Summer Palace, which is in central Bangalore. And they have this thing called the museum room, but there's really nothing except flex. As losers, you know, they don't have they don't have their <laughs> regalia to make museums out of. So there's just this like flex boards and there's this tiger replica. <laughs> which, which is like a completely like was it like a plastic replica or something? Yeah, it's a plastic replica of the Tipu's tiger, which in its actualness is a grand object. And I'm not going to show you that picture. I think everyone should spend time looking it up <laughs> and finding that because it's it's a treasure. Um, you can actually, they, in the v &A, they they crank it up and kind of through some electronic stuff. Or something, right? Yeah, they, they show they show how it would have sounded in that era and it's like a three hundred year old object. Um, but so in in Bangalore they have this they have this replica which is meant to be Tipu's dream of being a tiger attacking a British soldier. And it has these cranks that when you play, it uh, makes the sound of a man crying and a tiger. And I believe the man kind of has his arms and legs start <laughs> flailing. Yeah, or... yeah, yeah, supposedly. Um, so <laughs> this, this object I found very fascinating. And I went back home and looked it up. And I was really amazed at the original, which is so beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. And it's one of the v &A's most prized possessions. Uh, they've had it on display ever since they took it from India in the late 1700s, 1790, I think it was when wow, okay. Tipu was defeated. And they've had it on display even before the VNA was built, the precursor to all these things. They've always had it as a piece where people would come and look at it because it, for the British, it was a, I mean, they, they also appreciate crafts and arts in a different way. Um, but also, I guess it has its own politics of why they would display exactly. it. I mean, you know, it's very interesting that you actually brought this up. And one of the reasons why I was thinking about this is because uh, in Delhi, I mean, Delhi also has, and India has a large number of museums in some ways. And, and yet, uh, I don't know how many um, certified museum objects exist within those museums. But I, I think it's actually such... I mean, I personally really love it. I find it extremely fascinating. You know, like, um, so close to where my mom lives, there is, uh, there is this museum which was called the um, Tribes of India Museum or something of that sort, mm -hmm. you know. And I was 
and it's basically it's like right next to Paharga, and so it's a you know it's right next to the railway station, and you kind of walk in, and when you walk in, you're in a residential courtyard of sorts, like from one of those old Delhi houses, and then you take these stairs up, and basically you've entered into what would, I mean, structurally what would have been like a complex of, of residential houses, but you're actually inside a museum, and. Uh, and it's a completely absurd sight because you suddenly have these tribes that are being depicted through mannequins, right? And then, of course, there's stereotypes of how they are dressed and the activities that they would be doing that are enacted by these mannequins. And then, similar to your Tipu's tiger, there are these buttons. So you press these buttons and suddenly, like, fire will start appearing. But it's basically just like orange light, right? Yeah. But I'm also, I mean, so in one way, it's extremely fascinating, but it's also in some ways that I think there was such a massive resource of material and such a massive resource of physical history that's kind of been taken away from you without you having any say in the matter that, uh, you know, you start trying to recreate what you, what you think uh, a museum should be like. Uh, but what's so interesting in that dynamic, and I'd like to know your thoughts, is also that I think in in creating those museums, we are also we are feeding to the stereotypes that have already been created about a community. You know, as opposed to like suddenly this museum is supposed to be your representation of who you are. But even in that depiction, very often, you know, you'll have like the tribal man with a particular kind of expression or particular kind of body language or doing these acts or, you know, like suddenly there's fire. Like it's not just about fire. It's about these exaggeratedly like stereotyped sounds, like human sounds that, you know, that would be brought in. And uh, I mean, I just, it just reminded me of that. And I wonder what, you know, you, cause I'm sure you've been to a bunch of, museums around here in India as well. But I mean, this exists everywhere around the world. Even in Amsterdam, if you go to their museum, their ethnographic museum, right. there are all these stereotypes. It is full of stereotypes. I mean, that is how classically museums were. They were created with this purpose of making categories, of mapping, of making stereotypes. And that is what was sort of made evident right. in their collections. No, definitely. Um, yeah, but you no, know, I, I would love to go see this museum. <laughs> going to Come to, I mean, whenever we can move around, once we can, first we'll get out of our homes, then we'll get into the neighborhoods, then we'll think about interstate. But the next time that you are in Delhi, I will take you there. I hope. For sure. I hope it survives till then. But, you know, so, I mean, I'm just going to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry. So what we're also going to do is maybe from here, talk to Avni about another pro project that she actually just kind of, I don't know, started or is in the midst of um, which, well, it started from the Indian Museum in Calcutta as well, right? Do you want to talk to us a little bit about it and give us a sense of that as well? Um, so I, <laughs> I've, I mean... I was really, really fascinated by museums once I came back to India. After being at the VNA, when I came back, I started to look at all Indian museums in a completely new light because the museums that we have, the national museums, were also set up at the same time as the right. as places like the VNA, but their Indian counterpart. Um, so I went to the. So I was very, very fascinated by the Indian Museum because it gets referenced all the time at the VNA. A lot of the objects were taken from the Indian Museum. The Indian Museum was sort of the counter um, point and it was one of the oldest museums in Asia, it still is. Right. Uh, and of course when you're reading through Indian history, everything you read says that the original artifact is at the Indian Museum. Right, right like from oh, okay. the Kamaras to the stupas to fossils to whatever you want to see, and there's a it always says the original is in the Indian Museum. Indian Museum. And I had seen photographs that uh, my friend Kapil had taken of the Indian Museum 
several years back when it was going through a process of renovation. So they began renovating the museum in the last decade. Okay. And uh, they were sort of taking out the old furniture and moving it and rebuilding these new Sanmaika structures instead of the old teak. Uh, that's, kind of, that's quite sad. I mean, I remember seeing the earlier version of the Indian Museum. So very little of that is left now. I mean, they, they, they're trying, I think, trying to do their best in whatever sense. But of course, as you know, how museums in India are severely underfunded. There isn't enough interest in them. There isn't enough. Um, now, slowly more and more there is. But at that time, not so much. Not so much. So uh, I was very fascinated by the Indian Museum and what it is. And this earlier this year, which is actually the last place I traveled to. Uh, I had the opportunity, I applied for this uh, Max Mueller grant uh, to, the grant basically said that you have to do an artistic project at the Max Mueller um, in Calcutta. So, and you could propose anything. So I said, oh my God, I've never been to Calcutta and I've never been to the Indian Museum. So I'm going to say that I want to spend time in the museum discover it for myself, photograph within it, and then also spend some time at the Max Mueller and do a kind of workshop on understanding museums. My initial idea was to invite people into the Indian Museum and walk with them through it and hear, listen to stories. But then it just made more sense to do it sitting. I also had a very short time. So what we... I think it was a few, a couple of days or something. Yeah, it was, just, it was just a few days. And let me pull up some pictures of the Indian music. Yeah, that would be really nice. Um, also, I, I mean, I know that uh, we, we were quite excited maybe to see what you'd uh, built over there as part of your, your other selective reading of, of a different kind of museum. But I yeah. know that uh, at, that the person who's been documenting for you is still in Cal and of course has had some network issues obviously with the cyclone. So Yeah, unfortunately I haven't been able to get the originals but I, I'll, I'll show you some pictures I took with my phone. But uh, to start with, maybe I'll just show you pictures I took within the museum because I also really enjoy the process of, wait, do you see to have yeah. you? Yeah, okay. I mean, I can, uh, yeah, I can see the entire image, I think. Um, yeah, it is full screen. Yeah, 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 yeah. this is fine. Um, <clears throat> these are just some photographs of the Indian Museum in itself because a part of what I wanted to do was to create a zine, create a sort of guidebook of my own because I was reading a lot about the history of the Indian Museum how it came into being, what are the kind of objects it has, the hands that it has changed. Um, and so for that, I began to also photograph the museum with the little permission I could get. Um, and I photographed mainly the old uh, parts of the museum that kind of look a bit sarkari <laughs> look. But I mean, I think like in so many ways, these are also these become museumized, I don't know if that's a word, but it becomes museumized, you know, by the act of kind of putting them in your zine as well, because um, I'm assuming that this won't be looking the same way very soon, <laughs> you know. Yeah, uh, so I wanted to create a kind of reading of the museum, which I started to do. I started to, uh, you the, the video that I was showing earlier of uh, me flipping through documents at the b &A, Mm -hmm. um, where there are typewritten notes. The big files about like... I, I began to do a similar activity where I kind of looked through uh, things and made my own notes and trying to subvert this idea of um, what a narrative is of the museum. I'm trying to pull up pictures but... I'm that's, that's okay, I think we can... Get yeah. a sense of it, but so okay. So now you have been at this massive institution, like international institution, that's been able to acquire uh, a lot of works from India, and that's the one of the selections that you were looking at. Then we have you creating your museum of daily objects. Let's just say in some ways with um, 
with the snapped rope. And, and then we have you kind of moving into the Indian Museum to try a similar experiment. And, and so I just want to know, like, what's up with you and museums? Like, what is, what is your idea of museum that makes you happy? And what is your idea of museums that exist right now that is just annoying you? <laughs> you know, like, clearly there's a big fascination. So Yeah, but this is a fascination, one of many, many things. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, I'm, I mean, I am, of course, interested in museums because, A, in the museum, you see a breadth of things from, like, history, geography. You know, there's a, there's a yeah. sense of uh, meaning that you can make in a fantastical world. Because right. it's all all the objects are fantasy in a sense. I think my my interest is really in fantasy more than mm. <laughs> <laughs> the fantasy museum, is it? Fantasy museum. No, I mean I think I think museums are shaped like that, right? Either you look at them as sort of these great sacred repositories of sacred artifacts and objects that have been well preserved and documented and kept for you. Or you look at it as a graveyard of dead objects that have no relevance to your everyday. Or you look at it as a place to go to for stories, um, for a bit of both in some sense. And I think for me, what's really frightening in the current scenario in India is obviously the rewriting of history that's happening, Mm -hmm. where, um, where governments are talking about a particular kind of history that they want um, written and remembered. Uh, There is a rewriting of school textbooks. There's a rewriting of how we remember everything just in term, in in the span of when we went to school and what we read in our textbooks and saw in our films to what is happening now. Um, And that to me is, is frightening and interesting as a as a potent time to write histories everybody must be invited to create their own readings and create their own museums shit i'm so sorry i think someone's at the door and i don't know where are they just run off can you give me one no, 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 no. i'm so sorry i don't know if i'm supposed to go on but but maybe i'll try and pull up something to show in the meantime um what can we look at? So sorry for that. Some big chaos happened. <laughs> and I'm so sorry to you guys too. I had to run very quickly. But yes, coming back to what we were talking about. I'm terribly sorry, guys. Uh, I had to just make a quick I run. Just, I just pulled up some photographs from... Oh, nice. Workshop. Um, so while I was spending those three, four days in Calcutta, I would spend the mornings in the Indian museum photographing as much as I could, because my way of, so, I mean, the reason I photograph museums is also to render it to memory so that I can go back and look at it. And I'm interested okay. not just in what is behind the cases, but how it's displayed, how the building is, what are the textures, who are the people who run this place. Um, all of it is fascinating to me. So I usually carry a camera and I'm taking pictures inside the museum. So I would do that in the mornings, which by the way, in the Indian museum is very difficult. <laughs> Why is that? Lots of guards, there are lots of guards who are very worried, which is, which is a common practice in India. I think when you go to a museum, everybody's very worried. Right. Oh, don't, don't photograph. I don't know why. Yeah, I've always wondered that too. I've been like, you know, but I mean, and also like, it's really funny. I I don't know what happens in other museums outside, but they're okay with you taking that same photograph on your mobile phone, but they just don't want you with a camera. And I'm like, do you realize like the kind of images a mobile phone can take is fairly print ready, you know, sizes also. So yeah. I've not been able to understand that myself. Speaking of mobile phones now, it's great that everybody in the museum has a phone on all the time. And 
several people are video chatting and showing the museum to family that might not be there with them so i saw so many really fascinating interactions where a father was talking to his three kids who were sitting eagerly and looking at all the animal specimens and he's sort of just like showing them one by one and the guard running behind him and saying nay nay but you know how is this a bad thing he's literally <laughs> taking your museum online in one sense he's or doing what google arts and culture <laughs> center is trying to do as well oh <laughs> i yeah creating free content they should really <laughs> embrace they should it go for it. it yeah or there are people who are making tiktok videos in the museum obviously um one really fascinating thing is when you walk in the sculpture gallery people are always trying to become the sculpture <laughs> in front of yeah. it <laughs> which is which it's is really quite a It's quite a sight, I think nowadays. Yeah, I always would do it. I do it too. All the time. <laughs> really fun. Well, yeah. I was trying to enact this uh, Russian Revolution poster, which then Adil ended up posting, saying we're going to talk about museums, and I was like, "What? This is just supposed to be home performance, <laughs> you know?" But I think that's what's so exciting about access to museums, both, of course, physically, but also. contextual access to museum you know to make it more relatable and i mean of course i know that you've been to a certain degree fascinated by the object that goes into the museum and and the dynamics of it and i mean it's something that i've been interested with as well because even in my own work like somehow or the other the object comes in as a as a sculptural entity but also because it kind of is this unthinking unspeaking thing in front of you uh it can maybe incorporate multiple histories at the same time and and so so i wanted to just talk i mean i just wanted to know about like when you're looking at an object in the context of like is this museum worthy to you like what are the dynamics that come into play you know uh what are the is there a checklist or is it i mean what are what are those factors i don't know mm, museum worthy yeah I, i mean that's one of the main questions curators face right yeah what is museum worthy what narratives are you trying to tell what story you are trying to tell so because i have these images open i can maybe refer to this exercise mm-hmm. um so i invited uh i invited people from calcutta to come in the evenings to come to the max muller and bring an object with them right and similar similar to bangalore also in calcutta the indian museum doesn't have so many objects from calcutta and it doesn't tell a contemporary story of calcutta at all um and i thought that it would be fascinating if people could build their own museum so in a sense break down this idea of museum making or collection making um so I invited uh, people to come and a lot of uh, students who study at the art school close by came a lot of friends came and people came and brought little objects whoever could bring the physical object that was that was kind of the par- premise of the workshop that you had to bring a physical workshop and then a uh, object <laughs> and then we set up um we set up a big photocopier and said to people that you take your object and photocopy it and then sit down and write a museum caption for your object so this could be a very very personal object like this uh this pendant that this boy brought and and i tried to sort of get them to to articulate why they think it's important for it to be in their calcutta museum what story of calcutta does it tell right. um and the responses were really fascinating of course not everyone brought physical objects so some yes. people brought it but i wanted to take away from the actual object but talk about it so then i thought photocopying was a was a fun and easy uh, way to do it you know you just yeah. place it there get an image and get going on it uh i i just have four or five images unfortunately because uh i haven't been able to get in touch with them to get the final files and this was supposed to be an ongoing project at the max muller at the beginning of march end of feb beginning of march but uh now with the lockdown obviously uh and the cyclone i think things will just take a while yeah 
wow crazy <laughs> crazy mom what a year it's been man <laughs> wow um no but i mean i think this is this is really exciting and it's actually a great space to be in because i think even though you're kind of indoors and with your two dogs and uh, a little dip in the sea once in a while uh i mean it's i look forward to seeing what would come out from from this collection and these stories and like maybe maybe it's a museum of forgotten memories in some ways you know and yeah. uh, i think because we're we're already on our last minute time, but uh, i mean also i i i don't think there are any questions here yet but if anyone has any questions do you can type them in uh, right about now maybe and then you know we can answer them for you but i just wanted to say it's it's actually been really nice and and refreshing to have these alternative museums you know so much in terms of like now you have virtual museums that take place too ah well we'll get to virtual museums but virangana has a question here uh she says hi avni when looking at archives there's such a layered way in which archives are created and interpreted with reference to both time memory and personal histories in a way through your books you're creating a sort of subjective archive have you thought about maybe creating a memory reader for your books that links to a larger sense of looking at museums in a similar manner to the way to look at them wow <laughs> i i mean i think i i need to i don't know did you guys meet already you and virangana yeah so i think you it it's actually it sounds like a good idea i don't know if, if it's something you might be interested in i mean so in i mean thank you virangana for putting it like that because you really articulated well and yeah. uh, i think this was in a sense what i wanted to start doing with the zine that i was talking about where i take my own photographs and i have I haven't actually shown all the pictures that I had selected for this but I have over the years collected many many objects many kind of understanding uh, examples of this understanding of our relationship with object and remembering and memory and identity building mm -hmm. um that I have and I think uh that this sounds like a great way to tie those things together yeah I mean, I have I, the curator putting <laughs> putting it together really beautifully for us. Yeah, and, thank uh, you, Yangina. Yeah, so I I think you might uh, hopefully see that fairly soon. Then, Virangna, it seems like Avni is on that route already. Yeah, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, Niharika has a, a question as well. Oh, she's not got a question, but a reading reference. and this oh. is do take a look at uh kolkata chronicles by supriya nevar uh, a small book of personal narratives set in kolkata in kolkata also has associations with physical objects and material memory light read but very important document thanks Me for that neharika thank you yeah i realize that actually a lot of this already exists There's several people make several versions of this and that's the most fascinating like there is a project in the chitpur road neighborhoods yeah. that they've been trying to create a object uh guide to chitpur and i think these are these are the most fascinating ways to create history and memories and things right. legacy that things will be remembered in certain ways that are not one narrative that is not a unique yeah. version and not yeah uh, there's uh, no singular history basically yeah. in that sense and so you know the more layered and the more multiplied versions and more memories that i think we can in, input into that object somehow uh hopefully might also allow us to become more open open minded to the world i think over a period of time yeah like your own collection of objects that you were gifted yeah uh, actually you know so right? it's uh and that happens just like that i think suddenly you have an object in front of you and you realize that it has these relevances uh renu has another renu has a question as well are you photographic and recording your own personal objects that might be lost or become just memories due to whatever reasons like people's personal museums yeah i think what i i did with bangalore was kind of a personal object museum and what i do on my desk 
is always a personal museum of of like a tile that's fallen from our roof the other day <laughs> or yeah i made this i made this collection of so sometimes you can't take back objects right sorry th- i'm digressing a bit but no I no, just, no this is this fine yeah uh, sometimes you can't you can't take back things that you want to collect and hold on to so when i was i i studied bookmaking in germany in 2015 to 18 and as i was leaving i was trying to remember i was trying to capture this essence of being in bremen this small uh, port town in germany and so i created this ceramic tile installation which i now actually use as a coaster but you can't see it but it yeah. i mean these i made like a 100 tiles like this which are this sized Okay. uh i took took them took flat uh clay pieces and pressed it on the streets streets that i lived on so this was langemarkstrasse where my house was oh and okay both and i made a whole sort of street with tile impressions um uh, street impressions on tiles so it's and i thought this was an alternative way to also photograph where you're not photographing the street but kind of doing this kind of got it yeah <laughs> uh in a different medium which is what i love about the idea of image making objects collecting that they all have this um way that you can they seem to have like a secret synchronization going on you know that they just fall into place yeah. with each other well that's actually that was really beautiful i haven't seen that tile before i don't think we've spoken about Germany. No, um, I yeah. I what I did in Germany was also kind of like this, where I went to different museums in Bremen, and because I I saw this amazing artifact in a museum where they had a peppercorn under a microscope, okay, uh, inside this glass thing where you like kind of peer in and you see this tiny tiny peppercorn which is eleven hundred years old that was found incidentally. Oh. street that i lived in in bremen so it okay it, it said that it was found on that street and it talks about the trade relations europe and india because india is primarily where pepper grew right would have had through uh shipping so these things were brought in and so they they discovered a pepper corn which is 1100 years old and it's in the museum which i find mad. really really That's fascinating so mad yeah <laughs> Okay, so Mehs, yes. So she says a very good webinar, Ravni. I'm in Aurangabad since thirty years, and not gone to the museum here. Your talk has inspired me to go and check it out, I guess. And also, you can tie up with Google and showcase Indian museums on the Arts and Culture app as well. Yeah, I think we already do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Aurangabad has some fascinating monuments and places. We have one more anonymous attendee who wants to know: Was there ever a need to break free of all the hidden secret, to break free all the hidden secret, not displayed items that you found? I assume a lot of museums have that. Sorry, I can't see this. Uh... You know, there'll be a Q and A at the bottom bar. Can you see? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Was yeah. there ever a need to break free all the hidden secret? Not this. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you try. I'll have it. At the Indian Museum, it was super opaque because in the Indian Museum, you can't even get a library membership very easily. I found a door which said library, <laughs> and like, very quickly, hoping to go to their secret vaults where they have the five thousand Gandharas or whatever. Right. um and and then i walked through long cold tunnels and found the library and the librarian said that oh to go inside you have to get permission from the director of the museum and oh, no. aadhar card and pan card and <laughs> just everything that you own just put it out there property don't think, think about it, it. <laughs> uh so then i couldn't get to their vaults obviously but <laughs> ah no um, problem well, yeah. hopefully soon i i've heard of quite some wild things stored up at the calcutta indian museum so let's hope they're able to break them out of the closet and put it out there for us yeah mario has a question as well Oops. um <laughs> mario says thinking about museums as a site of preservation and learning on one hand 
but also that of violence, vandalism, and theft. How can we move the narrative a text from being clinical or linear to being warm, simultaneous, lived, and perhaps one that has remained oral or subjective? Uh, this was this was in fact what I was trying to get at with my uh, museum guide, the VNA museum guide, where that the the main colonnade that you showed, the first image that you had brought up, where yeah. Abita responded to, was yeah. it's it's really frightening because when you enter the so when you enter the museum uh, when you enter the gallery, there are these columns that have been brought from India, right, into the Ajmer colonies have been brought there and they've been put there and that they, they speak of violence and they speak of theft and they don't talk about it in the caption. And the reason I invited someone like Abira, Abira Kamran, whose Instagram everyone should check out, <laughs> um, uh, she, she speaks about it really poetically and in, in, in a warm in a warm tone and that was really the idea of trying to trying to bring multiple voices to respond to a lot of these things so at the same time there's wonder and amazement and inspiration but there's also um violence obviously in i mean the act of creating a museum itself often is is violent right i mean whether it's in the because invariably like and I could be wrong, but like most museum pieces have been acquired through a history of violence. You know, um, um, most colonized countries that you will see will not necessarily have their prized possessions of history. And then also who decides these prized possessions? Because those are narratives that are also created out of an, an outsider's sense of what is important in, in, you know, this country's history. And so... A, that acquisition, and then, you know, like Mario, you said, the negation of an entire different history that might exist, a different conversation that might exist. Um, actually, there's one more piece maybe in this that we can end with. And Avni, if I can request you to maybe open that page out, you know, where uh, it's, I think, the entrance, uh, entrance to the South Asia section that you have that was... Um, uh, someone, one of the artists had responded to it, Priya, Priya Khanja, yeah. which is uh, decolonize the museum. Maybe we can just uh, show you guys those yeah. pages because like, I think they're really interesting. It is, I think, ninety eight is yeah. the panel text, right? Yeah. Hang on. Uh, I sorry, you must have shut it by now. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, but I, I'll find it. Don't worry. Um, it's right before Avni Sethi's image, I think. Yeah, if we go up. Yeah, maybe one spread before that, so that, yeah. So this um, is, yeah. <laughs> so this is the main gallery text. So the, what I tried to do was also bring in things that were not objects in the collection, but this is the main gallery text for the South Asia Gallery. And it starts with these prosaic words, this gallery celebrates the arts of South Asia, um, powerful empires with distinctive artistic styles that flourished, fell, you know, this kind of flowery um, vic victory statement. And then uh, Priya, who's this brilliant journalist and writer, curator, she does multiple things. Uh, we were having a conversation and I offered to her that I was telling her that, you know, this this text I find really problematic and, and she has done work at, she had done work at the VA earlier as well and had written pieces on objects. Um, so we were discussing this and she then rewrote this piece and she kind of chooses these words and um, actually speaks of the violence, the, the problematics that, that ought to be spoken about but don't in the She's kind of reading the, between the lines very literally I guess also in some ways over here and and splendor of these objects played out of context risks washing over the huge tragedies that occurred under the oppressive force of hundreds of years of colonial rule over South Asia which we must never forget so she instead which the line here says the collection has continued to grow <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, and it was just so perfectly placed, you know, like I even like the way that it's 
very unassumingly put in the next page. So it's not like this, look at what they're trying to say, but it's just like, hey, this is what exists. And yeah, it's, it's fascinating really because in the museum, one of the texts says there's some, they have some object actually from Goa from the 1600s okay. of a Portuguese um, Christ figure or something. I, I'm forgetting what the exact object was, but it says when the European adventure travelers went to uh, India, they found these things. And, you know, when a child is reading this, they are reading, oh, they were adventurers. Yeah. Uh, but they were also <laughs> they were also missionaries. So this this kind of wording really shapes. Uh, you perceive them as also, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm I hope I can make it to Goa soon enough. I really do because uh, I I'd, I'd really like to show you the work I'm doing there, which has got to do with our local village museum over there. And I think you will find it very fascinating. Yeah, too. You even spoke about you even spoke about rallies and uh, how you were documenting histories of uh, yeah. Mm. It's a, it's a it's a fascinating place lost in time. But uh, let's see what happens with it. Hopefully, we'll get to see each other soon. Yes. Uh, but um, then, thanks so much. Thank you. It's really nice. I had a complete blast as always talking to you about it say hi to couple and the doggos after they're back <laughs> from their swim <laughs> and thank you everyone thank you for joining us and i know we ran a little over time but i think it's okay <laughs> you know and um, i hope to see you soon next week we have a completely different program we're going to start with if i am not mistaken yeah we're going to start with come up a tail who's also been making a book out of a different kind of an archive. Uh, and we'll be sharing uh, the schedule and details on our website and on the Instagram page. See you next Tuesday, Thursday and Sunday again at 6. And Eid Mubarak to everyone who's celebrating it today and to those of you who are celebrating it tomorrow. I hope you have a great feast ahead of you. Thank Good you night. so much, Anshika. Thank and thanks everyone for listening.